You have to change the layout pattern. Layout. Oh, here it is. Uh, can you see the full uh, full screen uh, of my slide, or uh, you are seeing the? No, no, there is a part of this next slide, so that half portion must yeah. be closed. Right, right. So for that, I, I think, think display setting. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Because monitor one has been disconnected. Yeah, can you see? Some delay there, yes, waiting. No, no, we are not getting your uh, shared screen. Okay, one second. Yes, screen is there. No, sir, it is not required. Well, screen to sharing has stopped because monitor one has been disconnected. Mm. There First is some option we have to yeah, I think so. Yeah, it is right now. Full full view. Okay. Okay, great. Great. It's fine. Now put your video on. If so I can enter. One second. Everything has collapsed. Okay. Yeah, here it is. No, just put your video on. Yeah, yeah. I got it perfectly. No problem. It's fine now. Okay, can we start? Yes. Hello? Yes, yes. Please go ahead. Okay. A very good afternoon to all. I am Professor Yura Thura. Welcome you all on behalf of Arthi Vidyapit Dim University College of Engineering Pune on fifth day of online faculty development program on recent advances in mechanical engineering design organized by Mechanical Engineering Department Bharti Vidyapit. Team to be University College of Engineering Pune in association with Atal uh, Academy. Today we have Mr. Pramod Lad, Senior Design Engineer from American Excel Manufacturing, is going to deliver on design of Excel and propeller shaft. He has completed his bachelor degree from Shivaji University in 1995 and is ex student from Bharti Vidyapit College of Engineering for master degree and completed in 2015 he has started his career from senior engineer as a production engineer from Force Motors in 1995 to 2007 for 12 years. Then he has switched for Dyna India uh, Tech Center for as a project leader in 2007 to 2009 for three years. And presently is working assistant manager in design department with American Excel Manufacturing. 
He has 23 plus years experience in automotive industry in various departments like production shop, assembly, manufacturing, and process engineering. Then product development, product design, and product management are these uh, areas of specialization. He has also worked on the vehicle platform, uh, HCV, LCV, tractor, passenger cars, pickups, and three-wheelers, etc. And also having work experience in OEM and tier one companies in India base and also USA based MNC. His uh, leadership and communication and presentation skills, and he's working with all the major design manufacturing hub in US, Europe, and South America. So today we have such a personality with us without taking much more time. I would like to welcome again all of you and I would like to request uh, Pramod Lard sir to take the charge of this session. Okay. Yes, sir, so, please. Uh, welcome. Uh, uh, can you hear me, all of you? Yes. Uh, okay. Okay. So uh, welcome all of you again and uh, uh, thank you, sir, for the introduction. Uh, sir, your voice is quite low. One second. Let me. Give me one second. Uh, maybe uh, I need to adjust the volume. Is it better now? yeah okay okay fine so uh thank you and uh, uh welcome all so uh let us uh, start our uh, today's uh, session on introduction to axle and propeller shaft design process uh while taking this uh in my mind uh, it is that uh, all of you uh, being the faculty members in mechanical engineering department itself. Uh, you know a lot about the mechanical design as such, and uh, it's not uh, that I'm going to, uh, uh, you know, teach you uh, how the design uh, is done, but uh, rather I will share my experiences uh, in the industry for say uh, about uh, so 23, 24 years uh, with which uh, maybe it will help you to, uh, uh, you know, uh, as an addition or to your academic experience uh, and that may uh, collectively you can percolate to your uh, students and uh, maybe that will be uh, more helpful for students as well. So that is the intention basically. So let's uh, let's uh, start. So today's agenda is uh, I'll just briefly uh, take you through the automotive industry uh, current situation. Then uh, we'll go through new tools in automotive product design like road load data acquisition. Then we'll start uh, about the axles, their functions, classifications, then uh, we'll have a detailed exploded view and it's a uh, uh, part wise uh, overview then uh, differential how it works its concepts then uh, maybe application engineering excel design process cad fea prototype and testing and in the similar way we'll go for the propeller shaft design process as well so uh, maybe uh, I will uh, have a question and answers at the end also, but in between also, if you come across uh, any question, uh, please uh, you can ask. Okay, so let's uh, begin. Automotive industry uh, brief updates. So internal combustion engine to electric is a, a big leap nowadays 
all of you must be uh, hearing about that and uh, automotive industry has uh, remained always pioneer of various technologies it has introduced many unique techniques and uh, practices in the industry and uh, it has actually led uh, all the industry so growing demand for better product has compelled the industry to remain in pace with time in terms of manufacturing process design quality marketing and all other domains of the product life cycle at present also automotive industry is on the edge of in terms of technology change current environment is challenging the industry to shift from internal combustion engines to electric vehicles there is a lot of internal churning within the industry and this is very challenging environment so as of now uh, actually uh, uh, most of the oems as well as uh, most of the big automotive supplier companies everybody is uh, you know uh, struggling to uh, uh, catch the pace of the time the demand uh, for uh, switching over from ic to electric uh, is pushing every industry uh, to uh, you know to their limits uh, to catch the technology that is the current uh, situation next is uh, automotive industry has remained the cradle for many innovations and uh, techniques so as you know that uh, um, many uh, what you can say military or even uh, uh, aviation uh, industry techniques which were very limited uh, use used by those particular industries were also adopted by automotive industry during the course of say last about 100 years history we can say they have and uh, they have always been um, always been accepting the new technologies we can say so making product uh, more reliable and is uh, always the aim of automotive industry and for this purpose various techniques such as apqp ppap dfmea pfmea dfx that is design for x what is that assembly production service manufacture etc these techniques are uh, we can say very well accepted and adopted by the industry and they are used also new technologies such as cad cam fea cfd and many more like uh, nvh also is very a big area where uh, we have got uh, recent technological developments so these are such uh, areas where uh, automotive industry is always trying to adopt new techniques there are various uh, statistical uh, techniques and six sigma problem solving techniques uh, i mean to say all the best possible uh, techniques all the best possible technologies are always adopted by automotive industry to uh, uh, keep their competitive spirit so that is uh, the uh, situation uh, so far what automotive industry has so let's get familiar with uh, this new technique uh, as we know uh, in uh, classical uh, way of uh, product design uh, always uh, we consider some uh, maximum um, uh, force or maximum stress levels and based on that all the products are designed but uh, with improvement in uh, what you can say uh, technology and improvement in uh, electronics and sensor technology and uh, their uh, obvious use in all other fields and uh, automobile is uh, one of the areas where it is again very aggressively used so with this uh, improvement in the technology and uh, computing techniques nowadays last at least two decades automotive industry is more relying on 
road load data acquisition. So this technique uh, is uh, actually uh, what we can say next uh, level of uh, road testing because uh, typically road testing was uh, done in automobile industry with uh, putting uh, some uh, dummy loads on the vehicles and uh, testing them on the road terrains and actually uh, in that case we used to wait till some component or system fails and then the analysis of such failure was done uh, post facto and uh, then certain conclusions were drawn but nowadays uh, designers gather a real time data from the vehicle system and subsystem with the help of uh, computers and various uh, you can say uh, sensors uh, applied uh, at the various points on the vehicle and uh, with that uh, data and with the help of computers all interpolations extrapolations can be done and uh, a better picture about the actual uh, stresses strains or vibrations that a vehicle experiences during the actual travel with actual rated load on the road can be uh, achieved and uh, this is uh, proving to be a very good, uh, very promising uh, tool in the hands of the designers uh, for, or we can say better uh, design uh, quality. So earlier we used to assume, say maximum torque condition or maximum stress condition and uh, we used to uh, design uh, the products which were actually um, sometimes over designed also. But nowadays uh, the optimum performance uh, products can be designed with this road load data acquisition technique. So it is more reliable output, I mean uh, input data for a designer is available. Data can be processed in a desired way and can uh, predict product life. Designs are getting optimized with this and uh, improved product life and reliability. These are main advantages uh, uh, of this uh, road load data acquisition technique. Uh, some associated uh, cons of this technique are it is expensive technique and different domain expertise required such as electronics or data processing or statistics you can see a couple of uh, pictures there uh, on car uh, you can see it is uh, fitted with all kinds of sensors and wires uh, at all possible locations similarly you can see a truck where uh, it's just a schematic diagram which represents uh, uh, road load data acquisition uh, process uh, actually maybe at the wheels at the beams at the chassis members at the engine uh, uh, at the transmission housing at various uh, critical locations normally uh, sensors are put strain gauges are put and all that data is uh, may be acquired uh, at a central device. Now, uh, further there are so many, uh, you know, um, options available, like uh, you put the sensors and everything on the vehicle and uh, a centrally transmitting unit will be there. It will continuously transmit the data and uh, you will have your own uh, centralized data center where all that information will keep on coming or there can be a dedicated unit which is stored in the vehicle itself and it collects the data and maybe after your uh, test run you can uh, take that unit and uh, further analyze the data so there are different options available and uh, those options uh, are again uh, what i can say different variations that uh, one can get Okay, so now let us uh, go to uh, our uh, axles. Uh, functions of an axle system, uh, axle at a system level, 
They are to support vehicle load, provide vehicle stability during cornering, braking, and running. Like consider uh, road different road terrains, uh, potholes, etc. So during that running condition, so provide interaction between vehicle and suspension, provide desired final reduction, and provide differential action as and when required. So these are main uh, functions of an axle at the system level. Okay, we'll see the classification. Classification of the axles is done on very different different uh, criteria, and that is explained in this slide. So axles they are uh, classified at least six seven uh, uh, different criterias according to power transmission that is the live axle or dead axle according to steerability that is steerable or non steerable axle according to axle arrangement that is single tandem tridem or even multiple there are four five live axles also but those are limited applications for our defense and all not uh, as a common practice then according to axle shaft and uh, housing arrangement that is semi float or full float or three quarter float according to assembly construction that is the split type banjo type or carrier type and according to number of uh, speeds that is single speed or two speed we'll uh, try to look at few uh, pictures and uh, correlate this classification uh, to uh, uh, those pictures and uh, those uh, concepts so uh, this is a semi float uh, axle arrangement as you can see here so this is the axle housing or axle casing and this is the axle shaft there is a bearing which is arranged in between the housing and the shaft <clears throat> and this is the hub where the wheel uh, will fit on this so uh, in this uh, type of arrangement the shaft is uh, coupled with wheel hub by using uh, lock nut and uh, axle shaft withstand the vehicle weight driving thrust and transmit the power to the wheels so in this case the vehicle load which is coming from the tire it is taken by the axle shaft the torque which uh, is transmitted from say center of the differential may be here so that torque transmitted that is also transmitted through this and uh, the driving thrust i mean to say various forces that are coming on the wheel uh, during a running condition those are also taken care by the shaft so it is simple and cheap compared to other types and applications uh, these are most commonly used for light vehicles uh, maybe passenger vehicles as well as goods vehicles up to two, two ton capacity this is very uh, common design um, in all markets in india and also in abroad markets this is a uh, full float design in full float design uh, we have axle casing and over axle casing we have the bearing this is just a schematic okay so um, don't get uh, confused this will just explain you how the loads uh, are transferred and the care is taken so this is the axle housing over which the bearings are placed and over which there is a hub and this hub is uh, uh, connected to the wheels so whenever the load comes uh, from the tires that load transfers to the hub and from hub it transferred to the bearing and then to axle casing so here axle shaft never takes the vehicle uh, load 
also when there are uh, running forces like uh, side thrust uh, or driving thrust braking thrust all these thrusts are also getting absorbed through the hub and these bearings and axle housing axle shaft uh, actually transmits only the torque to the hub so uh, okay we discussed this construction okay so axle shaft actually transmits only the torque to the uh, wheel hub and thereby to the wheels or tires so uh, in this case since only the torque transmission is the um, function that is left with the axle shaft so it is uh, very uh, safer design here the advantage is that uh, without um, removing any other thing you can uh, replace the shaft within outside only there is no interaction with the bearings or housings and uh, if the shaft is broken only the power transmission will uh, stop and uh, vehicle will remain in the supported condition so that is the advantage of this applications are most uh, heavy commercial vehicles like uh, more than two ton capacity vehicles and all uh, heavy uh, passenger vehicles all those use uh, this type of construction uh, to name i will say uh, like a say tempo traveler or say in the passenger category or say tata 407 or i share uh, this type of uh, vehicles uh, are all uh, you can say ashok leland or tata motor trucks uh, goods carrier trucks or uh, all the buses all those uh, contain this type of construction the reason is here as you can see the loads are transferred from the hub to the bearing to the axle casing and uh, shaft remains intact so uh, in the event if uh, suppose shaft fails the entire construction remains as it is and only uh, the torque transmission uh, functionality is affected so this is a safer design actually this is three quarter float uh, three quarter float is actually uh, in between the full float and uh, semi float here the axle housing is here on that the bearing is mounted and over that the hub is mounted and this hub supports the load so here the load which is coming from the vehicle is actually shared by the shaft and the housing so this is in between situation as you can see in the uh, previous example here the load is completely uh, from the what you can say wheels is transmitted to the shaft and then to the housing and here it is transmitted from the wheels to the hub and then to the casing and at the same time to the shaft so uh, it is partially taking the load so in this case major part of vehicle weight is taken by axle casing and not by axle shaft so uh, breakdown is less in this case as compared to semi float since the load is shared and applications of this uh, are uh, very rare uh, actually uh, this was used in the past maybe past 25 years back and uh, it is not much popular design because uh, this design actually uh, comparatively takes more cost and even it doesn't give the advantages of full float and uh, 
it has the disadvantages of the semi float also so putting on extra cost and uh, not getting the full advantage of uh, the construction so either you can go for the semi float if the cost is the constraint or you can go to the full float if uh, uh, cost uh, rather than cost safety is the concern so that is the reason why this uh, design is just a theoretical design nowadays and uh, it's uh, very rarely used on the vehicle level so as we saw uh, different uh, types of uh, axles or the classification uh, one of them was by the construction and this is the split type where you can see there is a vertical split in between the axle beam itself so this is the split type design where it is coupled by a flange this is uh, old type design again and uh, in some military applications also this is required because of the assembly complexity of uh, their specific requirements and very old type uh, vehicles had this type of design this is a banjo type design where you can see a beam is a, like a single piece construction though this is made up of different pieces but they are welded together and this is uh, many times this is sheet metal construction uh, for heavy commercial vehicles they use uh, hot formed thick sheets or light commercials or say up to 5 millimeter or 6 millimeter thickness sheet uh, cold forming is uh, a good option and uh, cold form sheets are used and this is made at the end these are the bearing housing uh, which is friction welded or co2 welded uh, to uh, this uh, banjo construction this is the drive head casting so this is a separate uh, assembly and this is attached to the main frame banjo so this is the banjo type construction this is uh, very uh, you can say uh, economical and nowadays this is in trend if you look below uh, uh, any commercial vehicle you will uh, see this construction this is carrier type or this is more popularly called as a salisbury type where there is a center piece casting carrier this carrier casting and there are tube assemblies which are uh, pressed from uh, both sides into this casting and further they are uh, slug welded or plug welded uh, through the holes on the casting at this place and uh, this design is uh, actually a little bit costly as compared to banjo type design but this is more rigid design and this is more popular in uh, uh, europe and america and uh, this design is more popular in asia and india because of its cost constraints this design is a little bit costlier but this is uh, what you can say uh, having a good uh, built-in strength so this design is more popular uh, uh, actually they call it uh, as a truck uh, what we call is uh, you know uh, pickups uh, so they call trucks and uh, this design is more popular in those vehicles here we can see a multi-axle vehicle photograph these uh, two axles they are steerable front axles there are there are this is uh, one more uh, axle which acts as a tag axle and these two are tandem axles these two are live axles so we are just looking at the classification these top two you can see these are live front axles and they are steerable so this arrangement is many times used for a four by four type of vehicles this is a dead axle tag axle this is used in heavy commercial vehicles 
this is uh, just uh, added to the vehicle to share the load. Uh, maybe you may be knowing that we have Axle uh, load ratings and uh, there are government regulations. We'll come across that uh, small slide later also. There are government regulations that how much load you can put on one axle and uh, you cannot violate those guidelines so if your vehicle carries very heavy load to uh, share the load and bring it under uh, government regulations we need to add number of axles and this kind of uh, axles are added you must have seen underneath the vehicle there are multiple uh, axles there are such axles added there are one or two live axles on the right side this you can see uh, back to back two axles both of them are live the front one is um, called as leading axle normally and the rear one is called as trailing axle or sometimes the terminology is this is rear front and this is called as rear rear actually the power which comes from the engine this is uh, given through this flange to this axle in this axle we'll see later in this axle we have a mechanism to divide that power into two and half of the power is sent to the rear axle and half of the power is uh, used by this axle so this is called as a tandem axle arrangement Typically, we uh, have a two or three or more axles also live. Now, uh, this is uh, this arrangement actually comes from the uh, maybe the um, requirement, uh, not the load is the requirement here. The requirement is like, uh, you know, uh, how big you can make this axle housing because you have to transmit the power and if the amount of power or amount of the torque transmitted is too big to be handled by one single assembly we need to divide it and that is the one of the reasons why we have multiple live axles that is one of the reasons these are uh, pictures of uh, various uh, drive head assemblies. Uh, these are typically used here. You can see this arrangement. This is one hollow casting is shown here. But in uh, this banjo type, uh, these are the drive heads which get attached to the beam construction, what we saw. So these are different types of with uh, diff lock and without diff lock uh, constructions and uh, these uh, you can see here this is a uh, shifting fork this is the shift sleeve which is used to lock a differential in uh, different situations we'll go through that this is a view which shows us the tandem axle power flow in diff lock engaged and disengaged conditions okay so this is the left side picture shows when a uh, diff lock is uh, disengaged. When there is a disengaged diff lock, uh, torque is input is uh, given from here and uh, through input shaft, there is a interaxial power divider or interaxial differential, what we call. In that interaxial, this power is divided and one output goes to the local axle which is within this housing and another output through this differential uh, gear goes to the rear axle and uh, it drives this axle so what happens when uh, actually sometimes uh, there is a situation that the one of the truck axle uh, is got into a mud and in that case uh, slip starts so in that case uh, we need interaxial uh, differential uh, lock so if we apply the differential lock 
this uh, differential action uh, gets stopped and whatever input torque is coming that input torque is uh, directly going to the rear axle and since this helical gear is engaged with this gear it is also received by um, this axle and it uh, gets transmitted to rear and uh, front axle at the same time and this is how the slippage is uh, prevented in the tandem axles this is a typical exploded view of a banjo type axle this is the carrier housing this is the axle beam or banjo housing and these are various parts that go inside this this is the crown wheel this is the differential housing this is pinion these are the differential gears this is differential shaft these are the thrust washers which go behind this axle gears these are the bearings this is the head bearing this is the tail bearing on the pinion there are two bearings one near to the gear teeth one next to it and this is the pinion housing in which these bearings along with this pinion they fit together and this is getting bolted to this housing over here and uh, this uh, is a carrier housing and these are the carrier caps in this the uh, differential assembly gets fitted and these are the axle shaft assemblies this shaft assemblies with their bearing seals and nuts and everything they come together and they fit through this into the axle so this is the typical uh, axle assembly arrangement this is the pinion flange this is the washer and this is the nut which actually gets tightened on this threading of the pinion and through this uh, flange and its uh, splines the torque get transmitted to this planes of the pinion okay uh, okay uh, i would like uh, i know um, being the um, faculty members and uh, uh, being the teachers you must have gone across uh, differential uh, and its functions i would like to uh, spend actually uh, five six minutes over this video uh, if you would like this will uh, explain you in detail how a differential works uh, can uh, anybody let me know quickly comment if you don't want uh, we can skip this but uh, this will be good to go through uh, are you okay shall we go through this yes sir okay uh, let me know if you are uh, able to listen to this uh, voice also can you hear the system voice or no no sir Huh? No, sir. Okay, one second. Uh, okay uh, let me go to this and be 
can you now I, I don't think still you are able to can you hear to this audio or not no sir no sir sorry no sir uh, you can you can uh, hold sir, your uh, you earphone uh, near the speaker the laptop bell then you can select <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, I think uh, right now. Is it? Still not, sir. Okay. When the truck goes around the corner. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, okay, what I will do is uh, maybe I will just uh, remove my headphone for a few minutes and uh, try to keep it uh, near to uh, the speakers. Uh, you can just uh, let me know in the chat box that can you hear it or not, okay? So the outside of the turn have to adjust their speed to keep even with the riders on the inside. The man on the outside has to ride a lot farther and a lot faster in order to keep up with the parade. The outside wheels must spin faster than the wheels on the inside because they have a greater distance to travel in the same length of time. When a wagon turns a corner, the wheels can travel at different speeds because each one can turn freely on the axles. And in the early automobiles, the rear wheels turn separately and only one wheel was connected to the engine. When only one wheel was driven by the engine, it had to do all the work, and it couldn't get a good enough grip on the road to do its job properly. So the one-wheel drive was soon out of date. But if two wheels are locked on an axle so that they are not free to turn separately, one or the other has to slide. So engineers had to find a way to connect wheels to the engine, sliding and slipping on turns. The device which makes this possible is a part of the rear axle. It is called the differential because it can drive the rear wheels at different speeds. The differential looks complicated, but once we understand its principle, it is amazingly simple separate axles and supported by a frame so that they can revolve freely at different speeds. Let's fasten a spoke on the inner end of each axle so that by turning the spokes we can turn each wheel separately. With a bar or close piece we can turn both wheels in the same direction at the same rate of speed. Let's get something to hold this bar in place so that it will press against the spokes. Notice that this support is not locked to the axle. It turns freely. Now we can spin the wheels by rotating the support. This is fine as long as both wheels are able to turn at the same speed. But Let's see what happens when we go around the corner. With this arrangement, we cannot drive one wheel faster than the other. And if we stop one wheel, the other wheel won't budge. Let's put this bar on a pivot so that it can swing in either direction. Now, the bar can still turn both wheels at the same speed. And because it pivots, it lets one wheel turn even when the other is stopped. But if turned too far, the bar will swing around until it won't drive the spokes that turn either wheel. We need another crossbar and more spokes to carry on the job. When we stop one wheel, 
the crossbars will continue to push the spokes of the free wheel around. As long as both wheels are free to turn, the bars do not swing on their pivot, and the wheels move at the same speed. Now we have the working principles of a differential. To adapt the model for use in an automobile, we will have to make a few changes. In order to reduce the jerky action caused by wide spaces between the spokes, we will put in more spokes. Further filling in the spaces between the spokes gives steadier, more continuous action. And changing the shape gives firm, constant contact. Now we can make the gears thicker and stronger. And we have differential gears. The edges are cut so that they will fit together more smoothly and silently. And another gear is added to share the work of driving the axle. The principle is the same. In order to turn the support and drive the wheels, we can fasten a large gear here, connected by a smaller gear to a source of power. Notice that the power is connected to the differential at the center line. We can make our model more compact by moving the gears closer together. When we put our differential in an automobile, we have to leave room for the drive shaft, which carries the power from the engine. We may build a part of the car above the drive shaft. But if we do, we won't have much room inside unless we make the top of the car high too. Of course, we could lower the floor and ceiling but the drive shaft would be higher than the floor. This would have disadvantages. A shaft in the middle of the floor of an automobile would be inconvenient for passengers and would be awkward for carrying luggage. Today, engineers have found a way to make the car roomier and closer to the road without a clumsy shaft above the floor. The drive shaft from the engine to the differential is lowered out of the way and the drive shaft is connected to the rear axle at the bottom. The new load center drive makes the rear axle quieter, stronger, and more durable because it gives better, smoother contact between the gears. The automobile of today with the load center drive is stronger and more broken. Okay, so uh, actually, uh, it it uh, what you can say uh, tells us a lot, lot about uh, differential, how it works, and also it has uh, told us. Uh, I mean. Uh, principal also told us but how they have told us that how the uh, propeller shaft uh, will come in between the vehicle and to uh, uh, put it uh, below the vehicle how the uh, pinion is taken uh, off the center and you probably know that uh, we call it as hyper gears so Hyper gears is the real invention uh, where we got uh, two, three major advantages. One advantage is, is that we could uh, lower the uh, propeller shaft uh, height uh, to that extent. Second advantage is the gear becomes actually quieter and smoother. And third advantage, uh, of the hyper uh, gear set is they become stronger also so it's stronger it is quieter and it helps to reduce the propeller shaft height uh, below the body so this is how uh, 
the challenges, uh, different challenges in automotive industry are met with different, different, uh, what I can say, innovations. And uh, at the early uh, stages, we had only one wheel uh, drive and rest of the three were dead. After that, uh, we got uh, two wheels live. Now we have four wheels live also. And this is how uh, automotive uh, inventions has helped to make it better and better. Uh, limitations of open differentials on low traction surface. So actually what happens when we have uh, here also uh, suggest to go through this video. There can. example is known as an open differential. Open differentials are inexpensive, lightweight, and require little maintenance. However, the major disadvantage of an open differential is that the engine's power follows the path of least resistance. This means that in cases where one wheel has less traction than the other wheel, the engine's power will go to the wheel with the least traction. A way to limit this loss of traction is to limit the amount of independence between the two axles. This can be accomplished via a number of mechanical, electronic, or hydraulic systems, which are known as limited slip differentials, or LSDs. The benefit of a limited slip differential is that the amount of power sent to the wheel with the least traction is limited so that the wheel with the most traction receives continuous power in order to get the vehicle moving. The disadvantage of a limited slip differential is the amount of power that can be transmitted to the wheel with traction is also limited. The next type of differential is known as a locking differential. Locking differentials have mechanisms that can literally lock the two rear axles together when needed. With a locking differential, both axles receive equal power so that the wheel with the most traction will always have power. Locking differentials are often used for heavy duty off other low traction situations. The disadvantage is that they have to be unlocked to allow differential wheel speeds during turning. If the axles are locked during turning, handling is negatively affected. An alternative to differential based LSDs and locking differentials are brake activated LSDs, such as Toyota's auto LSD system. Brake activated LSDs use an open differential, but selectively apply the brakes to the wheel with the least traction. This takes advantage of the path of least resistance to transfer power to the wheel and isn't having the brake applied. The auto LSD system is designed primarily to improve traction at times when the vehicle is likely to get stuck. The system's electronic control gives it better torque transferring abilities than other types of differentials. Other benefits of these systems are that they require fewer parts and are less complex than mechanical systems. This reduces maintenance and weight. Okay, so as you know that open differential has a inherent disadvantage that on the low traction path, Whenever you come across one wheel on the say sand or say icy surface, uh, then uh, it tends to slip and vehicle doesn't move ahead. The reason is actually uh, the this example. The reason is actually uh, differentials are speed differentials and torque equalizers. Hello. Hello. Hello, is it good? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Go ahead, sir. Okay. Okay. So please, uh, please, please understand. This is very important uh, learning about the differentials that uh, actually uh, many people uh, doesn't know uh, for lifetime. Differentials are speed differentials and torque equalizers. Whenever there is input torque from this pinion, 
that gets equally distributed between the left and the uh, right uh, side of the shaft. And the difference is made between the speeds because our problem at the beginning was on the turns we used to uh, have the slip of the tire, right? And we wanted to have the different speeds. So we invented this thing and this thing actually differentiates the speed on the LH and RH wheels and actually it transmits the torque equal to both the wheels. Now what happens if you have one wheel which is on the slippery road that means there the traction is less means the amount of effort required to move the tire over the surface that is the traction right. So the traction on the say IC surface is less as compared to say a normal uh, uh, tar road uh, surface we will say. So what will happen? The torque will follow the least resistance path and that is why the wheel will start slipping. Now you know the equation of the power. Power is 2 pi nt upon 60 or 60,000 depending upon the watt or kilowatt, right? So N is the speed and torque is in Newton meter. Now engine is providing you the power. Assuming that engine provides the continuous power. Power is not going to change. The value of power is not going to change. And if the torque requirement is reduced, what will happen? N will increase, right? To maintain the same power. Engine is suppose providing 100 HP power and your torque requirement because of slippery surface has reduced. Your N has to increase in that proportion to maintain P the same. So that is how tire starts slipping and tire starts running faster. Okay, you must have experienced that, right? Okay, so let's go to, sorry, yeah. So this is uh, one of the, this is actually published in the gadgets frequently in the government of India, motor vehicle department gadgets. And this is the latest uh, load ratings, what per axle we have. So uh, as you can see here, uh, uh, 28.5 tons with, uh, pneumatic trailers and 27 tons is actually uh, per axle uh, what we can have the maximum uh, tonnage okay so to abide by these rules many times you need to uh, increase the number of axles in the vehicle okay next we will uh, go through a formal design process how it happens uh, as uh, in automotive industry we have uh, application engineering where uh, systematic approach towards the project coordination is done here actually the en uh, engineers uh, of the company uh, talk to a customer and they try to understand the customer's technical requirement, non-technical requirement, implied requirements, commercial requirements, and they act as a bridge between the customer and the organization. Application engineering help the customer to select the right product from the product range and they help the product design team to correctly define the customer's uh, requirement so say suppose if I, I am designing some axle i'm not always directly interacting with the customer we have a specialized a separate team of persons who actually interacts with them they get the things converted into technical terms and they bring it to us as a designer and then we work upon that so what are different inputs that are required for axle design gross vehicle weight Overload. So many times, depending upon the applications, like say, for example, I'm just giving say, uh, we have Tata Ace or we have got say 
uh, Ashok Leyland those vehicles which are like a one, two, three ton uh, type vehicle. So uh, Ashok Leyland or Tata knows with their own experience, past experience, that how much overloading happens to their vehicles, and they specify the overload factor to us. Engine RPM and torque, transmission ratios lowest and highest vehicle speeds that they are expecting spring speed, spring seat span wheel track wheel base tire radius ground clearance requirement many times ground clearance requirement uh, as a buyer you must be finding this as a feature in your uh, vehicle brochure right so these things plus pinion inclination distance and height of vehicle cg from the front and rear axle service life how much it is expected and area terrain application like normal hilly snow desert etc and different test criteria these are the things that are required as input for a designer so there are uh, very different approaches like if it is the vehicle is run uh, to be in the normal like say india or say Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Pakistan application, there will be different things or Nepal or any other hilly region, there will be different things. Snow means North America, Canada, those areas will be different things and desert means like uh, Gulf countries, uh, there will be different considerations like, you know, specifically desert, uh, we need to care more about the seal and heat related failures oil seal failures because uh, sand particles enter into the vehicle and they uh, cut the seals and all that. So there are special uh, design criteria in snow, uh, you know, the oil freezing and that related activities in hilly, the torque requirements are different. And in the normal uh, we have, so all these things uh, we need to know and you know uh, road load data collection also is done so uh, axle uh, design based on uh, all these inputs the gear ratio the final reduction uh, is in the differential right so the gear ratio and gear size axle beam size then differential gear and spline details axle shafts differential case and these things are uh, designed and finalized Product design is combination of space packaging and engineering specifications requirement. So this also you have to keep in mind, you know, sometimes ground clearance. They have decided a certain tire uh, for their vehicle as a customer say Tata, and they ask us to design the axle. So with the given tire, they want to achieve certain uh, ground clearance. So the tire radius you cannot change and you have to fit your axle below the vehicle so it has got certain size so if you reduce the size of height of your axle from the height of the tire you need to check always the ground clearance you need to check for the packaging you need to change your strategies accordingly ring gear ratio is primarily driven driven by vehicle max and mean speed Uh, vehicle uh, minimum speed engine rpm vehicle uh, minimum speed is calculated by engine rpm into transmission first gear ratio into axle ratio into pi into tire diameter so minimum target speed of vehicle is defined by vehicle manufacturer hence we get the axle ratio found from the above equation once the actual ratio is finalized, the gear sizing is calculated as per the standard gear manufacturer softwares like Gleason, Orlicon, Klingenberg. These are the uh, specialized uh, uh, gear manufacturers or uh, gear technology experts, I will say. Uh, we get the gear manufacturing machines from them. We get gear manufacturing technology from that. We get gear manufacturing softwares from, from them. So uh, hybrid gear is very specialized uh, design and uh, that is done with uh, the softwares from these. These are the global leaders in uh, that. 
Axel uh, component design. So Banjo beam is considered as a simply supported beam of wearing section. Generally, the deflections are calculated using moment area method. Maximum deflection value is fixed considering the vehicle application, overloading pattern and material properties. So this beam, this is the beam and this is designed uh, uh, as a wearing uh, section beam and uh, moment area method is normally used. So how much the deflection maximum deflection is allowed? That uh, as a designer, we have to think and uh, that depends upon the vehicle application. I mean to say, is it a passenger or goods vehicle? What is the overloading pattern as specified by the OEM? And what are the material properties? So typical materials used for this are BSK 46, ST 52, E350 or Salima 350 and many others. Uh, basically, low carbon steels with high ductility are uh, considered here. This is a uh, differential gear design. So in the differential gear design, uh, you we get a, a two pinion with a two axle side gears or four pinion with a, a two axle side gears combination. Basically, number of pinions are uh, decided according to the load condition for all uh, heavy vehicles, uh, trucks and all. We have four pinion combination. For all light applications, we have a two pinion combination. So how much torque is to be transmitted? Maximum rotational speed and contact stresses. These are the criteria. Uh, earlier when we were seeing that video, you know, there was a big gap between those pins initially, then they converted to gear and the gap went on reducing. Uh, actually, uh, at the design level, the backlash between these two gears is uh, one of the very important point uh, to be kept in mind. Materials are typically uh, alloy steel like 353, EN353, 20MNCR5, 50MNCR, 15MNCR5. So these are the materials that are used. Again, uh, if we go to the heat treatment details, uh, these are case carburized typically and uh, maybe 58 to 60, 62 HRC is the hardness level and uh, uh, typically up to two millimeters is the case depth that we keep. These needs to be harder uh, because uh, they have to uh, deal with the contact stresses, high loads and they need to be soft at the core because they have to also sustain the impact loads. So uh, that is very uh, big area again, heat treatment and uh, materials uh, we need to explore. Axel shafts, axle shafts are designer, designer considering type of axle and a loading pattern. For shafts used in semi float axle design, consideration is given to combined torsion and bending load because there is, uh, we have already uh, studied the types of axle like semi float full float and uh, three quarter float in semi float the vehicle load is also supported by the axle shaft as well as it uh, transmits the torque so we have to consider combined torsion and bending uh, load criteria and based on that we need to uh, design the shaft for shaft with full float only torque is uh, transmitted through it so consideration is given to torsional uh, rigidity criteria Generally, shafts are designed in such a way that in the event of any malfunction, overloading condition, they are supposed to fail. That is fail safe technique is used with respect to shafts in the axle uh, design. Why it is so? Because they are in, inexpensive. I mean to say they are, their cost is low as compared to all other parts involved in the assembly. Number two, it is easy to replace because if you, uh, fail safe design any another component probably you need to remove the axle uh, entire axle housing or maybe you have to remove the differential assembly and then you uh, need to replace that part so it is very difficult but uh, axle shaft uh, even driver can also replace it uh, without any help of uh, 
specialist or mechanic so typical materials used are high grade steels like se 1039 1055 1050 and you know axle shafts are induction hardened in uh, this area where the bearing and the seal is uh, coming in contact and at the inside area where the splines are uh, there and they are engaged with the inside differential gears so these areas are typically uh, induction hardened then a differential case differential case perform uh, it acts as a support to the crown wheel it acts as an enclosure uh, sir, uh, how much is the time criteria? I'm, uh, I think, uh, are we running out of the time or can we go another 20 minutes, 15 minutes? Hello? Yes, sir. We have 15 uh, Will it be minutes, okay? Sir. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll uh, go through uh, this uh, within 15 minutes. Okay. So it acts as an enclosure for uh, differential gears and it absorbs uh, crown wheel pinion reactions also. Typically, uh, in this, uh, apart from the loads, uh, packaging is also one of the constraints that we need to consider. And materials that are usually here are ductile cast iron, such as ASTM F536, because uh, this also uh, takes the shock loads. So instead of uh, gray cast iron, uh, ductile uh, cast irons are used here. Next comes is uh, once uh, we uh, you know uh, finalize uh, the axle uh, component design uh, with the help of uh, say first principle calculations, uh, we go through the CAD process. You know what is CAD and uh, we prepare the layout with uh, help of uh, CAD. Then detailed design is uh, done. Then uh, drawing preparation is done. Then stack up analysis is done. So stack up analysis is basically understanding uh, relationship between the assemblies uh, and uh, relationship between the gaps or interferences in the assembly then a detailed consideration is given towards component design in CAD for proper fitment, say oil flow requirements, strength considerations, manufacturing feasibility, machining and inspection considerations, assembly and servicing considerations and so on. So all these we need to keep in mind while designing the component. Then FEA. So after uh, uh, all the calculations and uh, based on that, all the components are designed. The first cut design is actually taken for FEA analysis. And FEA analysis, uh, we uh, do uh, simulation. Actually, we simulate the load conditions similar to uh, uh, what you can say, a field situation and we uh, get the results uh, in terms of the deflections or we get the results in terms of the stress levels you can see here the hot spots this is the red things here here these are called or this is the differential case where you can see near the dip pin and shaft there are these are called hot spots where the stresses are firing so you need to uh, refine your design and uh, you need to go back, iterate it, check it again, and uh, confirm that it uh, uh, passes uh, the required um, number of cycles. Next is uh, prototyping and testing. So after a few results and with uh, uh, enough uh, amount of uh, confidence level, we go for uh, prototype manufacturing. Nowadays, uh, rapid prototyping is also in practice and uh, to certain extent, it gives uh, some desired uh, results or early uh, studies are possible uh, with the rapid prototypes. Yes, we also make uh, rat rapid prototypes. And uh, this is uh, oil flow testing. So, you know, uh, the complex assemblies like uh, tandem axles or the uh, rear drive modules or PTUs. We need to study uh, the oil flow 
and we have to ensure that uh, proper lubrication happens to each and every component involved within the assembly. And uh, for that, uh, we do uh, uh, oil flow study. Uh, CFD oil flow vision, I had one YouTube video, but we don't have the time for that. So let's uh, skip that. Okay, uh, go for testing. So there are various uh, standard tests that are performed on the axle. Crown wheel and pinion fatigue test, axle assembly torsional abuse, axle assembly torsional fatigue, differential gear fatigue, axle shaft ultimate, beaming fatigue, spindle bending fatigue, brake flange torsional fatigue, axle shaft rotary torsional fatigue, up cornering and bending fatigue. These are the different tests that are carried out. These are the different test setups as you can see. Uh, here you can see this is the beaming uh, fatigue test where here uh, you know the tires are uh, replicated and these are two columns where uh, uh, lip spring uh, area uh, is uh, replicated and the load is applied vertically alternately up uh, i mean uh, zero to max zero to max and this is uh, subjected to fatigue here uh, you can see uh, differential, uh, differential function test is going on. Here the structural test is going on and at the other side uh, again a side thrust uh, test is going on. So design up, uh, okay. So we'll go to design of propeller shafts. Propeller shafts are basically combination of universal joints and a tube for length and a slip joint for length change compensations. And uh, there is a component design and phasing arrangement and a resultant uh, angle. This is a exploded view of a propeller shaft uh, universal uh, joint. This is propeller shaft assembly and a spider is one of the most critical items actually that is uh, and bearing rollers. These are two critical items that are um, uh, very important from the design perspective in the propeller shaft. And uh, they are uh, designed uh, with the consideration of bending and uh, contact stresses. These are the details of the calculation. These are needle roller bearing uh, considerations. This is a uh, consideration for a tube. A uh, tube is uh, designed for uh, maximum, uh, what do you can say, torsional shear. So I hope I could, uh, uh, th this was very, uh, what do you can say, uh, fast, but uh, the topic is also very vast. So I hope I could uh, cover uh, most of them and uh, I hope that this could help you. So thank you all. Uh, if you have any yes. questions, we can take the questions or we can move to our next uh, segment. I don't know. Yes, sir. Definitely you have uh, given us this proper guideline for this. Any question from participant side? We are waiting. Question from participants. Actually, this requires at least four hours each two days session. Yes, sir. It's it's okay, but we have again uh, time limitations in this particular yes. FDP. Yes, yes. We are trying to go on. Okay. Yes, uh, so if any what, questions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which type of the software or name of the software that we are going to use for CAD and FEA? Just name uh, of the softwares. For FEA, we use uh, basically uh, ANSYS and uh, for CAD, we use uh, NX and CATIA normally in our organization. But CREW is also one of the very popular uh, software. Okay. 
So Creo, NX, and uh, Katia are very popular uh, among the CAD community. Mastran and Ansys are uh, very popular among uh, uh, FE analysis, and HyperMesh is used particularly for meshing. For testing, you have uh, given number of lists for the testing methods. So all the tests are uh, based on the fatigue test only or any other? Uh, yeah, they're, they're, many of them are fatigue tests. Some of them are like structural uh, also. So most of them are fatigue. We repeat the number of cycles for the given and uh, is there just... is there any chance where we can use composite for this particular? Uh... Uh, so far uh, in practice, uh, we have not tried uh, for axles, uh, but yes, for propeller shafts, we have tried. Uh, for uh, tubes, actually, we have used some composite materials, but its use is uh, very uh, limited. I mean, uh, the cost wise also, it's uh, okay. a bit costlier. So very high end applications, some European vehicles, uh, they use uh, composite for propeller the shafts. Cost only, is the concern accidents. while we are looking for the composite in the propellers. Right, right. Okay, participants, any questions from your side? Okay, actually being engineer, we tend to design the things, uh, but uh, 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 with my practical experience, let me tell you, uh, actually cost remains at the top, okay. top of the engineering also, because we have to sell the things, right? Yes. I so, think there is something in the chat. Yeah, there is a chances in automobile industry switching to electric cars. How you see the changes in the differential design? Hello. Hello, Lad, sir. Am I audible? Hello, Yes, we have in that or has been disconnected. Yes, sir, you are audible. Yeah. So the question was there. Hello. Hello. Just a few minutes. I trying. think Larsar is disconnected. Participant B, please be online. Uh, we will, after this particular session, we will start our valedictory function. So P, uh, please be online. Some instruction will be given at the end.
हेलो इट ऑडिबल लार्ड सर हेलो हेलो हाँ यस सर नहीं और आई थिंक आई गोट या या सॉरी आई गोट डिसकनेक्टेड फॉर सम टाइम के विदिन टू थ्री मिनट्स वील स्टार्ट आवर वैलिडिटी फंक्शन ओके कुरकुड़े सर हेलो यस सर यस सर सुतार सर यस यस सर आई एम हियर ओके सर ओके आई थिंक वी विल स्टार्ट आवर फंक्शन वैलिडिटी फंक्शन मोहित सर यस सर आई एम हियर uh if possible uh, switch on your videos ओके okay, मैं शाला स्टार्ट यस सर हेलो गुड आफ्टरनून टू ऑल द इनवाइटेड गेस्ट स्पीकर्स प्रोफेसर्स एंड पार्टिसिपेंट आई एम प्रोफेसर दादा सो मोहिते ऑन द बी हाफ ऑफ भारती विद्यापीठ डीम टू बी यूनिवर्सिटी कॉलेज ऑफ इंजीनियरिंग पुणे I welcome you all again to this valedictory function of one week faculty development program on recent advances in mechanical engineering design organized by department of mechanical engineering and sponsored by AICT Atal uh, AICT uh, AICT training and Atal academy uh, to begin with this valedictory function first of all i would like to request uh, dr vk kurkute sir uh, to focus on the session conduct over to you sir thank you dada so good afternoon to all i am dr vijay kurkute i will give you the highlights of this fdp so in last 5 days we are meeting with experts from different fields from the academia and from the industries there are eminent personalities from different iits and niit and also from the industry we have started the session with dr s p singh from iit delhi where he have elaborated the vibration control systems the next Dr. Pawan Kumar from IIT Indore has explained the machine learning and especially with reference to the condition based maintenance. In this, he has illustrated the bearing related maintenance and the machine learning techniques. After that. Dr. Pandey from IIT Hyderabad, a beautiful presentations of fundamentals of vehicle dynamics with some three-dimensional models he has developed. After Akhilendra Singh from IIT Patna, he has given fracture mechanics using new numerical methods. Dr. Pandey from IIT Hyderabad talks on memes. Dr. Kumar from NIIT Goa discussed the crack flow simulation using the finite element method. Here 
he has discussed the case studies of marine grade aluminium alloy. Dr. Vinod Sahu from NIIT Jamshedpur explained the advances in gearing and its applications. Dr. Das from IIT Guwahati throw lights on nano finishing for some tribological consideration. Dr. Lal from NIT Gujarat gives progressive failure analysis of laminated composite structure. Dr. Ganga Dharan from NIT K Surkatkal explain the machine dynamics and experimental methods. And after that, few industrial experts, Mr. Chintamani Kulkarni, Vice President of Indian Seamless Metal Tubes, discuss various case studies of failure analysis of material, around 10 to 12 case studies, and why failure takes place. What are the different stages of the failure right from the material, design, manufacturing, and the service? All the aspects he has covered. And in today's session, Mr. Manoj Badwe is a senior manager in Tata Motor Limited, Pune, gives the industry four standard details and its current status in the industry in this country. And finally, Mr. Pramod Lard is a senior design engineer in American Axel Manufacturing, and also he is alumni of the college. He has done the post-graduation from our college, and we are proud that today we are calling him as a chief guest for this validatory function. He explained the design of Axel and propeller shafts, a vast experience in this part. So in this day, five days, a number of experts have given eerie case studies, some industry related issues, failures and all these things. Now, I request Dada Sumoite to continue further. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, now, I would, uh, I would like to request a participant to share their experience and views about the FDP. First of all, I would like to request Dr. Rajesh uh, Palampalle, sir, to share his views regarding this FDP. Rajesh, sir. Hello. Uh, good afternoon, all. Yes, sir. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Hello. Go ahead, sir. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks to all of you. Myself, Rajesh Vaburo Palampale. Uh, I am a researcher scholar. And uh, this is my first ATL uh, online MDP program. Uh, recent advances in mechanical design engineering. Uh, by day one to till today, Every day, uh, the session get glowing like a flower, and uh, cakes are beautiful day by day with a lot of knowledge and experience that I, I, I have got. And uh, I learned uh, very much clear about uh, the research area and the advanced trade in mechanical design, uh, like uh, mechanical vibration, and the dynamics, vehicle dynamics, uh, and the design thinking. And in, in in between session, I also learn about mind management, which is, I think, more important these days. Uh, and uh, the last in uh, gearing applications, uh, the Industry 4.0, and uh, today uh, the propeller and shaft design. From this session, uh, I will definitely learn a lot with the practical and theoretical aspects and 
the whole case study is given by the experts uh, all the uh, doctors um, who uh, gives and share their uh, best uh, experience with us and uh, uh, i thank to the uh, principal chief guest uh, and dean sir and uh, kb suta sir dr adi sir and all the organizing committee uh, for uh, giving us uh, the day by day instructions uh, via email and via uh, whatsapp and this is uh, my first session uh, first fd program so i enjoyed uh, a lot uh, thank you so much uh, thank you bhakti vidyapeet team to be university for organizing organizing such a great event thank you so much uh, stay healthy uh, stay happy thank you sir thank you thank you so much sir uh, now i request uh, uh, mr sukadeep chogule sir to share his views so, uh, am i audible sir, sir? Yes, sir. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, yes. Okay. So, good afternoon, one and all. Uh, myself, Sukadeep Sogulli from Pimpri Chinsur College of Engineering and Research, Rawat Pune. Workshop. This has been an absolutely informative and enlightening workshop. Knowledge of each and every uh, what we can say expert or presenter was totally amazing. the presenter was basically trying to explain from scratch like uh, in one of the session uh, in the say composite material uh, i think yes in composite material sir was explain from types and application of the material to the simulation using matlab the sessions are very informative uh, i also like to thank you the entire team of bharti vidyapeet uh, college of engineering pune for arranging the most important session uh, which we needed for our mental and physical health during this pandemic situation that is stress and mind management session so i congratulate and thank you respected principal sir respected head of mechanical engineering department uh, dr kuldeep rade sir uh, mohit sir amar sir entire basically team of bharti vidyapeet thank you for uh, successfully organize this one week workshop so thank you all uh thank you thank you so much sir uh, now uh, i request shivam gupta sir to share uh, his views regarding fdp shivam sir hello uh okay uh, if any other participant want to share uh, uh, their views regarding this fdp they can unmute yourself uh, you can unmute yourself and share uh, your views here yeah. hello sir hello yes sir go ahead sir Uh, myself pritesh sachin i am working as assistant director in himalayan group of institutions lucknow uh, from since tuesday all the sessions were uh, i think they were very much knowledgeable and uh, there were few very new concept which were uh, being taught by the various expert to us at least uh, i have taken much interest in the fracture mechanics there were two three lectures on fracture mechanics that was very much close to me so i learned a lot even other lectures today lectures on this automobile sector was very encouraging and many new facts which we can share with our student and even we can go ahead the other research work because there are many facts which we were not knowing that these researches can be done and many new facts were being uh, you can say we were we were being informed by them so i am very thankful to the college for giving such wonderful uh, uh, this fdp to all of us and uh, all all the um, i will also thank all the experts also even the convener sir you have done this fdp in a wonderful way we were all were informed all the things much before and uh, there were no you can say no problem to us so i will once again thank all of you thank you sir
thank you thank you so much sir is there any other participant want to share uh, his views regarding this fdp please unmute yourself and uh, say few hello words sir of this fdp uh, professor yes, yashwant sapke from siangad college of engineering sir uh, i would like to tell you sir this is very well organized fdp even all sessions were very knowledgeable and one more thing special about this fdp sir you did the youtube streaming of all the sessions so it is also a good thing for us that you on youtube also we get the sessions all the sessions were streamed on youtube it was a very good thing that we observed about this fdp thank you sir uh, thank you thank you so much for your comment sir thank you so much hello sir Yes, sir. Go ahead, sir. Sir, I am Parag Suryakant Sarode, Assistant Professor from Vidya Vardhini College of Engineering, Vasai. Uh, the you, FDP was organized very well, and the experts were expert in their subject. And it's good that you already shared the videos on the YouTube also. That will act as a reference material for our further. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Hello, sir. This is Dr. G. Ganesh Kumar from Kitswarangal, Telangana. Hello. Yes. Go ahead, sir. Go ahead, sir. Uh, the FDP was conducted very well, sir. It's an excellent FDP, and I thank all the experts and organizers who has dedicatedly worked for this FDP for the benefit of the members, sir. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Good afternoon, sir. This is Bhumi Nadan. Uh, good afternoon, Sorry. sir. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, I am uh, Bhumi Nadan, uh, working as assistant professor in aeronautical engineering, Bharat Institute of Higher Education Research, Chennai. Oh, this uh, five days FDP was very useful, sir. Actually, I am uh, a person uh, working on uh, materials and research related to materials. So the especially the fracture mechanics and the composite material topics are very interested. And uh, even though I was working in that field, I learned more in this uh, from this uh, FDP. And uh, the video lectures uh, uh, immediately okay. were live telecasted, and uh, uh, evening yeah, itself uh, we got those videos through mail. Uh, it was very useful for uh, especially for uh, uh, attempting those quizzes and all. I suppose if you have missed any words and all, after watching that video, I have answered all those cues. It was very useful, actually. Instead of, uh, suppose if you have missed, I have watched the videos again in the evening and uh, attended the cues and all. And um, uh, it was very useful. And especially the Art of Living session, I liked the most because uh, the resource person was patiently replying to us for, uh, I asked more queries uh, in the Art of Living session. So he was replying very patiently and uh, very thankful for uh, all the organizers and uh, Bharati Vidyapi University. And um, all the best for you also, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Hello. Hello. Shall I move forward? Uh, yes, sir. OK, uh, let us move forward. Now, uh, uh, today we have uh, uh, Mr. Pramod Lard, sir, as a chief guest for this valedictory function. Uh, I would uh, like to request Dr. Uh, uh, Pramod Lard, sir, to share his views regarding this FDP. Hello. Good morning. Uh, I mean, uh, good afternoon, all uh, sirs. And uh, it was actually a very uh, nice effort. And uh, from the various reactions what we received so far, uh, one can definitely say that uh, everybody involved in this uh, activity of the FDP arrangement, uh, including, uh, I will say, the conveners, the HOD sir or the even principal sir or everybody has uh, paid his uh, due attention towards uh, this activity and that is why uh, this could happen in such a well organized manner and uh, 
uh, looking at the reactions what we received uh, from uh, all the professors across uh, this platform uh, the purpose is uh, very much served uh, for this fdp and uh, the um, what you can say uh, the uh, additional uh, knowledge that uh, bharti vidyapit wanted to uh, share with the faculties so that they can upgrade themselves and they can share it with the student community that purpose is uh, very much uh, served with uh, this uh, uh, what you can say uh, very well uh, organized uh, activity i will say so uh, congratulations uh, to all the um, organizing uh, team members and uh, uh, thank you and uh, all the best uh, for all such uh, organizations, uh, successful organizations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Now, uh, I would like to request uh, our head of department and convener of this FDP, uh, Dr. K.B. Sutar, sir, to say a few words. Over to you, sir. No, uh, am I audible, Dada, sir? Yes, sir. You are audible, sir. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, all. First of all, I welcome our guest for this and uh, speaker for last session, Pramod also many of this professor K. Rade and whole team of all participants. Let me tell about the context of the series of FD. last year when all came we returned to college after the first lockdown in 2020 we were uh, given the task that means all the department by our principal uh, pranam Mehra, that each department needs to organize some online events that uh, the period during which we were uh, online and as the department for NBA accreditation, we need to organize FD. In that period, we thought we, as we are organizing online FDPs, we made four teams of the faculty member department faculty. And then we started working actively, we have started in, in May 2020 itself, and from 2020 December, we organized four online FDPs uh, in the department. One on nanotechnology, on energy technology, on advanced manufacturing technology, and the last one was uh, sponsored by Atal, uh, that is on robotics. In these four FDPs, more than 60 experts again from IITs, NITs reputed industry like this FTP uh, had uh, we had got the experts and then uh, more than 2000 participants across the India they participated in these FTPs so we got a lot of success there also and in the same line this year also it was decided the area which is remaining that is design engineering and the task was given to Professor K. Rade and his team we need to organize FDP in accordingly. Uh, we were in process of uh, doing it on our own, but incidentally, we had put the proposal for Atal FDP and it was sanctioned. And coincidentally, the first FDP in this uh, academic year, we started with recent advances in uh, I'm very proud that only six faculty members in the department, so the department consists of more than 25 faculty members. As I mentioned, we uh, work in a group and all other groups also help, but actively participation of the six faculty members, including Professor K. Rade as the coordinator, and along with him, Professor V.K. Kurte, Professor Amar Pawar, Professor Dada, to Dada so Mujhe, uh, Professor Sanket Unde, Professor Raj Thorat and Professor Prachi Dixit. They worked hard day and night, starting from the search of 
uh, very good resource people, resource people from IITs, NITs, and reputed industries. Uh, we searched and we contacted them, and uh, incidentally, uh, now we are seeing the fruits that this FDP has gone a very well uh, among the participants. More than 200 participants participated, and I'm very happy that today this feedback session, more than five to six people uh, gave their feedback on their own. It's not a small thing because when people are giving feedback on their own, that means they have learned, they have understood, they have been benefited uh, large uh, through this FDP. And I think we, this has uh, really satisfied the purpose of uh, organizing uh, this Atal FDP uh, on recent advanced cancer uh, design. Uh, I'm very much thankful to all our uh, team of the faculty members, including Professor K. Rade, and also I'm very much thankful to our principal, Dr. Anand Rao, uh, who encourages us in organizing these kinds of events. Thank you so much, and I expect that uh, the participant there will be more participation in our uh, forthcoming events, those 